Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Meaty Minute. Today we're going to talk about reintroductions. I think it's a big topic that we in our Nutrition with Judy practice talks about. I know a lot of carnivores are like, why would you add anything back when meat is the most nutrient dense, but this is real life, our practice, people want to add things back. So I think the first thing we recommend is first of all, we have the carnivore cures all meat elimination diet. We have a free cheat sheet guide. So I'll put that in the show notes. Make sure to check that out. It tells you how to do each phase of the protocol to see what you can eliminate and then what you add back. And I think our first step is before you add back any carbs, ideally, it's always to add back as you heal meats that you were not able to tolerate at one point. So as an example, we have so many clients that cannot tolerate ground beef. So before you decide to add back broccoli or steamed broccoli, we highly recommend that you try to add back ground beef first in any conventional form that you can tolerate and see if you can tolerate it without a histamine response or a, I don't feel well, or I have loose stools now. So it is ideal to try to get the rainbow of meats and all of the animal products first as a reintroduction before you add plants. Now in real life, we know that doesn't happen. So in our practice, we see people will add more plants first because they can tolerate it before they add certain animal products. But the ideal recommendation is that we add back animal products first, but let's talk a little bit about the reintroductions. How do you know when people want to reintroduce? Is it that you, if I want to add back broccoli, I'm sure that's not the food that people want to add back, but let's say it's broccoli. (laughs) What would you have me do? I actually have more clients that don't want to add things back in, but after some time, I'm like, well, why don't we start? Why don't we start with the next option of set of meats that you did or did not try? So most people are coming to us beef, beef only, or maybe beef and some pork, things like that. So if they're, you know, beef only, I say, okay, let's try some other things like next on our introduction list would be like egg yolks or organic turkey and things like that. So if they're not having any other meats, I always recommend adding those things in next because ideally we'd be eating a variety of meats in order to get enough nutrients. in. so beef alone might not be the most perfect diet. It's still missing a little bit of B vitamins that we can get in pork, or we're still seeing a lot of people who eat beef only um, have a fatty acid need and they might need to increase their salmon and stuff like that. So if they're not touching on any of these other foods, I always say, let's, you know, try and get those things in first is adding the little bit of steamed broccoli in with it going to be an issue. No, but if you add them both in at the same time, we're not going to know what's affecting you. So if you're going to add them both in, at least start with the meat for a few days and then add in the broccoli. But I always try and get them into at least more of the meats before any of the plants. Which is where I think the food and mood journal is so important. This is where, and I could link to our food. I think we have a free food and mood journal, but it's so important to track our symptoms because if, if I were to ask you, what did you eat two lunches ago? It's really hard to remember. We oftentimes think of our symptoms based on a general, oh, I I know I don't really do well with pork, but how do you really know unless you've tracked it? Maybe it's because every time you use, you try pork, it doesn't make you feel good. But if you were to do a symptom tracker or a food and mood journal, and you say you ate this, how did your gut feel? If you took supplements with it or like hydrochloric acid or digestive enzymes, how did you feel? And then if you track everything a week later, you could look back and say, okay, I had a good week or a good day of no digestive issues. And then you could look back at what you ate. And then that may be your new baseline of what you need to eat to get back to that non-symptomatic day of digestive function. And that's how you can start troubleshooting and make it individualized care in terms of what works and what doesn't, especially when you have a reintroduction. So let's say you try to reintroduce the broccoli and you don't feel well, then go back to whatever foods makes you feel well and have that consistent digestive function before you add something back. Yeah, I think you guys touched on some important things so far when you said that it's very important to do it one at a time. I think too, like um, where you said like, I know pork doesn't make me feel well, but it's like, are you also always eating it with eggs? And you just feel like giving up pork feels more realistic, you know, because these are both foods that can be really insidious. I think it's hard for people to wrap their brain around in the beginning, the most baseline is meat, salt, and water. It really is. Bringing in 
the higher histamine foods. And, and it also might be because we do, you know, there's a reason people come to work with us and it's usually not that it worked right away for them, that they need some guidance, they need some support. And that's where we can come in and really help them figure it out. And I think that it's confusing a lot of times for people that aren't diving down and really looking at the nuances of a diet. And it's like histamines. What, what do you mean? I'm, I'm eating, I'm, I'm on a carnivore diet. There's actually a lot of foods that still are high in histamine on a carnivore diet. And that can be really insidious for some people. Not everybody's gut can handle that in the beginning. And also we're working with a subset that oftentimes does have SIRS, right? There's other underlying things going on. And if you can't even introduce like a bite of a histamine food without a reaction, after you've removed it for, let's say, six weeks, there's probably something else going on. But if you just need to take out histamines for a couple of weeks just to quell the inflammation in your body, and then you realize, hey, you know what? When I have a little bit of ground lamb now, I, I seem to be okay. You might just need to quiet the noise for a short period. And that's where I think it's, you know, it's very bio-individual. And it can help to work with somebody sometimes because it, it can, can sometimes feel overwhelming. It's like the histamines and then you got the egg whites are no good. And then it's like, but I can't do this and I can do this. And what phase am I at? You know, in the beginning, you go back to basics. But yeah, when it comes time to reintroduce, it's really important to do it one at a time and make sure, like you said, if you do think there's even the slightest possibility you have a reaction, pull it back out and make sure you get back to comfort before you try anything else. Yeah. And I think when people, we have a question, question in one of our questionnaires that say, do you feel better when you don't eat? And we have clients that feel better when they don't eat. And it's not a blood sugar dysregulation thing, but if you feel better without eating, then there's, it could be an issue beyond diet. And obviously we start with the diet first, but let me ask you guys, a lot of people will tell me I'm just not strict enough on carnivore. Like I just can't get myself to eat just beef, salt and water long-term or beef and water only. And that's why I'm not healing. Do you guys think that's the answer for most people? That can be a loaded question because, <laughs> because does that mean that they're doing beef, salt and water and eggs? Or does that mean they're doing beef, salt, and water and, you know, work tends to be a struggle. I see that a lot on paperwork, actually, that work is a struggle. Like, what do you mean f- work? Like the, f- the, the food is everywhere. The food is everywhere at work. Oh, so and they're they eating just, their work? They, maybe that too. That would be, that would be a stomach ache too. They just, they, at work, it tends to be a place where they give into it. They're busy. It's available. It's accessible. It's social. So it's like, what? what is it that's keeping you from what you're considering to be not carnivore hard enough? Because different clients right. consider that very different, right? Like I'm not carnivoring hard enough because I have cheese once in a while, or I'm not carnivoring hard enough because we do taco Tuesday and we also do Friday night pizza. And, you know, it's like, whoa, those are two totally different things we right, need to right. talk about and address. I do think that, yeah, a lot of people feel like they're failing at it already. Okay. So let me ask it this way. Then I know that our very first phase of the the strictest phase of carnivore cures elimination diet is uh, ruminant meat, salt, and water only. Do you think that everyone needs to get there or when people are there, why do we put them there? This is a quiz of our job. (laughs) No, I would say if going all in at first seems intimidating, then why don't you just eat within the carnivore food pyramid, like at least stick meat based, um, getting in enough nutrients and see how you feel. If you are not moving the needle, then I would say the fastest way to see what is driving your symptoms is to go meat based or to go, um, beef only. If you can't heal by just doing the, you know, meat pyramid or a meat based diet. If you're still affected, then the easiest thing to do is say, okay, let me do beef salt water and start slowly adding things back in. Not saying you have to stay there, but if you don't feel well, the easiest thing to do is start from the ground and build your way up. I agree with that 200%. A lot of our clients, it feels overwhelming to go beef salt and water unless they come to us already feeling that lousy. They're more open and, and that's a realistic thought. I think anybody listening to this podcast is going to be able to relate to that. The worse you feel, the more you're willing to do whatever anybody says. 
right? Like, it's almost like, tell me what to do. I'll stand on my head all day and, you know, I'll do anything you tell me to do. That's how lousy I feel. But then we also get people that are like, I don't feel well. These are my health goals. You know, how, how are we going to tackle this? And I think, you know, Caitlin said it perfect, eat within the pyramid and let's start there. Right. But if we're working together for already a few weeks and you're not seeing the needle move at all, it might be time to remove some of the things that can still be really insidious for some people that have gut dysfunction and sleep problems. And, you know, we have to, we have to remove the things that can still be insulting the gut and still be insulting all different autoimmune conditions. And, you know, it's not always as simple as just eat within the meat pyramid and you can heal. So the way that I created the carnivore cures elimination protocol is I looked at all different elimination protocols. Then I looked at all the different anti-nutrients and I just took lots and lots of effort into the research of what is the safest foods to first have. And so even within the animal based world, we considered histamines, we considered some animals will have some level of anti nutrients because of the plants they consume, and it may still be in their system. It's a decision that everybody needs to make individually, like my mom never suffered really from other things other than her high blood sugar and cholesterol. So for her, it didn't really make sense to have to go beef only. So she went animal based or all the um, the rainbow of meat and it helped her blood sugar go down enough. Now, if it didn't go down enough, I would probably have her like, well, why don't you have two meals instead of three and see if that would help reduce the insulin and the blood sugar. And if yeah. that didn't work, then we might say, okay, let's remove some of the dairy because the dairy has a little bit of carbs, but that would be my progression for her. But if somebody is super sick, it's like the decision of, do you want to do animal based and then see, okay, it's still not working. And then we slowly titrate down and remove everything. Or do you want to just rip off the bandaid and go just be for just ruminants so that there's not many different varieties that you're eating so that if it's, you're just eating beef, salt and water, and you're still reacting, then maybe it's not beef that you're ideally tolerating. And so maybe we just eat lamb. And then if lamb helps to reduce your symptomologies, then at least then we can find a new baseline of your symptoms and health overall. And then we can see, okay, what else can we add back in? Cause I don't think ruminant meat only is ideal long-term cause you can argue the omegas. And I know people are going to totally argue against me with that thought, but just from a, I cannot as a nutritional therapist say you can just eat ruminant meats when there are certain like magnesium is very low. Um, thiamine is very low. Omega threes are very low in certain meats. Now, maybe we don't need the amount that the RDA recommends, but as a nutritional therapist, I cannot with a good conscience say, just eat beef long-term. I think people can do it, but is there a risk? And I just think it's smarter to eat the rainbow of meats with all the different nutrition. I think that's at the core of if you need to eat ruminant meat only or not at a certain point, like, so let's say you started with all the rainbow of meats and if that's not working enough and then you went ruminant and if ruminant didn't work enough. I'd say like two, three months. Would you guys say that's a sufficient amount of time to know that? Yeah. And then beyond that, if it's not working, then yes, we got to look beyond the diet. I think that's sort of our, you know, mode of operation in our practice, because you have to think at two, three months of eating just beef or just lamb, and you're not healing, then there's got to be something else. And it's not because you didn't get the aged one or you got the aged one or the, the salt wasn't the right salt or that it is because you're adding too much salt. I know we, one of my clients said this really perfectly, but when you're really sick and someone said they healed because of X, you really want to, or hope that maybe that X is my thing too. And that will help me heal. And so you grasp for straws and it's like, maybe it's the X, maybe it's the Y, maybe it's Z, and maybe that will help me heal too. And that client had SIRS, but in the end it was, she just needed SIRS. And it wasn't just that she needed the perfect diet, but she tried every yeah. single modality and biohack and realized none of those things helped long-term. Another thing people question when we do reintroductions or when we ask to go a little bit stricter is do I need to do grass fed, grass finished? Like, is there a difference in healing or will I be affected if I keep in like conventional meats? Yeah, for sure. Um, I hear that a lot too. This is going to sound complicated, but also simple because it's not, it's not a one size fits all on that. It's always going to be the most important. And I tell all clients this to stick to carnivore, right? So if it's like, if all you can afford is the conventional or that's all that's available to you because of where you live and shipping or whatever, it's usually a financial standpoint, then, then stick to carnivore. Okay. If within that, 
you think you might actually be reacting to the, you know, corn fed or soy fed or grain fed, you know, we might have to dig a little deeper, but that's not going to be as common as the food reaction to like, you're most likely going to tolerate conventional ribeye possibly better, especially in the beginning, than you might grass fed and finish ground beef. It's not a one size fits all, but you have to talk it through with the client. We have to, we have to figure out the bio individual needs, but I would say the most important thing is to stick to carnivore and, and tailor it from there. Most people probably want to reintroduce things. There's things that they miss. They miss variety. It's not that the diet's not working, but they just miss other options is what I'm hearing from a lot of people. If we get any people just starting out, they're like, this is so easy. I could do this forever. Like I don't have to think or prep. Um, I don't have to worry anymore. And some people really like that. So I am in that camp where it is just easier for me not to chop vegetables. So I it's just easier. Um, some people just miss the variety, I think. And that's where they start to want that reintroduction. Yeah, that's, that's what I see for the most part, too. I see people with the end goal to be to reintroduce, you know, that doesn't mean session one, everybody's saying to me, what day do I get to eat such and such, though, I have that, I do have that also. <laughs> um, I feel like the end goal, though, usually is to reintroduce and I, what I feel viscerally from people is the social aspect of it. Yes, is it a taste bud thing? Maybe at times too, but it's the social aspect of it. They really want to just be able to eat what other people are eating. You know, maybe it's that underlying peer pressure we felt as kids and it's still there on some level, right? You kind of want to just go with the flow and be doing what other people are doing and not always have to, you know, bring your own food or not eat at all. And it's decisions we have to make when we're healing. But the end goal for people is that they usually want to do the things at the party or whatever. If you want to introduce carnivore, just follow our, um, the cheat sheet that we have that again, we'll put in the show notes, but once you're thinking of reintroducing, maybe start with the meats first. And then if you want to add plants, it will be very bio individualized. Some people say I've never had metabolic syndrome. So fruit is the way to go. Some people will have gut issues. So then probably lectins or um, gluten is never the way to start first. So it really is individualized because all plants have anti-nutrients and it's figuring out which plants make sense for you. I think personally for me, I want our community to have food freedom where I suffered from an eating disorder for such a long time. And I want us to be able to go to a restaurant and I know seed oils aren't that good, but I would rather us go to a restaurant, eat the meat there. If you want to eat a little bit of sides just to be social and then you just move on and then you go back to right. your regular carnivore meals. Cause that's how I do it. Now, before I used to carry my butter to the restaurant and I would not eat anything else. If anything was cooked in anything, if there was a little bit of pepper, I wouldn't eat it. And it was very hard on our social lives. But as I have food freedom and just health in general, I can go to a restaurant I don't even ask what they cook it in. And I'm sure some people are going to be shocked at that, but, <laughs> and then I just eat the meat. And if once in a while there's like Kevin's eating a little vegetables, maybe I'll have a bite, but that's it. And then at home, I pretty much eat just carnivore. And, but it took years to get here. There's no more stigma with food. If you have that strong enough pull with sugar and being a person that was severely eating disordered, I would argue that that pull, if you have one small bite of a donut and now you're off and you're triggered and you're dopamine, and now you need to go and rush and go binge, then I would challenge that maybe you're not fully healed, that maybe you still need to figure out, you know, what is it that's triggering you that much? Or what is it that has that lure towards sugar is addictive in its nature, but let's say fruit, what is it about the fruit that's so luring? And maybe there's something beyond that. Maybe there's some trauma, or maybe there's an addiction component that when you're stressed, you turn to that food for comfort. You just need to find a new habit. So I think it's always about root cause healing. And if you can tolerate other foods, but you're 95%, 99% of the days you're eating just meat, that is ideal. And if you have a little moment where you, like Dr. Baker says, he eats a little bit of birthday cake on his kid's birthday. If you can do that, that is ideal in a place, not to say to eat the cake, but that you don't have this emotional attachment that now you're like, I'm going to go eat pizza and I'm going to party hard on carbohydrates because I had just a little sliver of cake. And if that's what happens to you, especially a few years into carnivore, I think there's more healing that needs to be done, especially on a therapy side. If you guys 
have any thoughts, put it in the comments. And if you have other topics that you want us to cover in a future meeting minute, just let us know. But otherwise, we will talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.